Live from London, this is The World Today. Hello, I'm Paul Barber. Our top stories this hour. China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi is in Germany for the Munich Security Conference, where conflicts in the Middle East and Ukraine dominate the agenda. Ukraine's president calls for more weapons as his troops withdraw from the eastern city of Avdivka, marking Russia's biggest gain in months. Trapped and nowhere to go, the humanitarian crisis deepens in southern Gaza as fears grow over an Israeli ground assault on the border town of Rafah. And from peace to development, leaders gather for this year's African Union Summit. China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi has called for a two-state solution and more effective mediation efforts to solve the conflict in Gaza. He was addressing world leaders at the Munich Security Conference, where the fighting between Israel and Palestine is dominating the talks. Officials in Gaza say the Palestinian death toll is approaching 29,000 and there is growing pressure on Israel from many countries, including some of its closest allies, not to expand its ground offensive into the border town of the Palestinian people have been displaced for generations and are still unable to return to their homes. This is the longest lasting injustice in modern times. China firmly stands on the side of fairness and justice, works hard for a ceasefire, and does its best to protect civilians. Push the Security Council to adopt the first resolution since the outbreak of the Palestinian Israeli conflict and issue a position paper on the political settlement of the Palestinian-Israeli issue. China calls for accelerating the establishment of an independent Palestinian state and convening a larger scale and more effective international cooperation conference so that the peaceful coexistence of Palestine and Israel can be truly realized. Our correspondent Natalie Carney is there in Munich. Natalie, what more can you tell us about what the Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi had to say? Yes, he did broach a number of security situations around the world in his about 15-minute speech, of course, the situation in Gaza, where he called on, uh, he presented Beijing's position calling for an immediate ceasefire of the situation and to lift any blockades uh, on humanitarian corridors, as well as to hold international peace conference to revive this two-state solution. On the issue of Ukraine, he said that China was working tirelessly to find a political solution to the crisis, but that both uh, countries needed to have their security issues recognized. He also touched on relations with the U.S. and uh, even touched on uh, how China was part of the reconciliation between Saudi Arabia and Iran and how that's sort of helped bring the Middle East closer together. On the sidelines today here in Munich, uh, Foreign Minister Wang Yi also met with uh, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz as well as as uh, the EU High Representative for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy, Joseph Borrella, the two exchanged views on the situation in Ukraine and in Gaza and spoke about how China and the EU could work closer together to, to help with the challenges of this much more chaotic and uncertain world. China and Europe, as the world's two major forces, two major civilizations and markets, should be aware of the international responsibilities both undertake. A more stable and closer China-Europe relationship will be beneficial to each other and also the whole world. We should avoid the interference of geopolitics and ideology, adhere to the positioning of partners rather than rivals, and work together to inject positive energy to cope with the turbulent situation and provide a new direction to overcome the difficulties together. Natalie, the Ukrainian president, Volodymyr Zelensky, has also been speaking at that conference there. Uh, this is happening as Kiev's troops withdraw from the key eastern town of Avdivka. Uh, did he talk about that, and what are his demands of Ukraine's allies? Yes, he did speak of that situation. Uh, his uh, army chief basically gave him the news that he was going to withdraw troops from Avdivka uh, just hours before Zelensky took to the stage here in Munich. Zelensky called that decision the right choice, saying saving lives of Ukrainian soldiers is their top priority. He also spoke about the difficulties in finding rotation for these soldiers who are very, very tired. And there was even the subject of potentially lowering the age of conscription in Ukraine. But 
but during his actual address, he spoke about returning to a rules-based world order in 2024 in which security could be a reality again. He did thank his allies very much for their attitude towards Ukrainian refugees, uh, millions of people that have been forced to flee the country, and also, of course, for the substantial military assistance that the U.S. and uh, that, uh, that Europe has provided, but did stress the very important need for weaponry, calling it an absence of weapons. We can get our land back, and Putin can lose. And this has already happened more than once on the battlefield. Dear friends, unfortunately, I'm keeping Ukraine in the artificial deficit of weapons, particularly in deficit of artillery and long-range capabilities allows Putin to adapt to the current intensity of the war. The self-weakening self of democracy over time undermines our joint results. He also had a very busy day on the sidelines here in Munich, meeting with the prime ministers of Denmark, as well as the Netherlands and the prime minister of Bangladesh. He also spent some time with the U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris. The two had a press conference after in which Zelensky said that the delay in humanitarian aid to the Ukraine was not considered a betrayal. He understood that there's internal politics happening in the United States, but that, of course, is more concern for the Europeans if the U.S. do uh, delay or, or reduce their support to Ukraine. Natalie Carney in Munich. Many thanks. For more analysis, I spoke with Jamie Shea, a senior fellow at Friends of Europe and a former NATO Deputy Assistant Secretary General for Emerging Security Challenges. And it's sobering news for the Ukrainians that the Russians, despite enormous losses, have pressed forward. Uh, they've been able to fire ten times more shells than the uh, Ukrainians. They've also brought their air power to bear, uh, dropping 60 bombs a day on the Ukrainian forces. And so it was only prudent, really, that Zelensky should beat a tactical retreat uh, before the Russians surrounded the Ukrainian forces and forced a, a mass surrender. So in the short run, it does suggest that the Ukrainians, instead of planning offences of their own, have got to hold their line throughout the winter and probably through the, the remainder of 2024 in the hope that the Western arms deliveries, particularly from the United States, resume uh, as they were over the last uh, two years. Ukraine can recruit more soldiers and ramp up its domestic production. So yes, in the long term, it's not impossible to lose a battle, is not to lose a war, uh, but certainly uh, uh, the Russians seem to have the advantage going ahead uh, into the spring. And Tell us more then about what this does mean for Russia, this withdrawal from Avdivka uh, by the Ukrainian troops. Is, is it a big victory for them? Will it change the, the, the front line? Will it change the fighting significantly? Uh, it, well, obviously, the Russians will play it up. Uh, you would expect uh, President Putin to do precisely that, particularly as he goes forward uh, towards the uh, elections in March, even if the result there is is not in doubt. And uh, although the Ukrainians have lost a lot of troops defending the place, the Russians have lost far more estimates of 20 to 25,000 casualties and a lot of equipment trying to take the place. So it would have been, I think, a psychological blow for Russia, given the resources that it's put into capturing Advika, to not achieve uh, that objective. But this town is not considered by Western defense strategists to be of great strategic significance. Uh, uh, it's not a city. It, it's not a vital communications link. If the Russians are not able to sort of push out quickly from Medvika to take a lot of more territory uh, beyond, uh, then it, the damage can be limited. The key thing now is for the Ukrainians to fortify their lines, uh, prevent the Russians having a breakout, but realizing that the front is still 1,500 kilometers. That's a big line to defend, and Russia will be probing along that front for further signs of Ukrainian weakness. And at the security conference in Munich, uh, we're hearing, you know, France, Germany pledging more support for Ukraine. How does it measure up to what Ukraine currently needs? And are there hopes that the US Congress will agree to approve more aid? And, you know, can it really shift things as we approach the two-year mark of this war? 
Well, everybody who supports Ukraine will be hoping, of course, that the U U.S. Congress will finally come over the line with the $61 billion aid package, which is obviously crucial for the long-term uh, rebuilding and reinforcement of the Ukrainian army. Uh, uh, but although there was a little bit of hope uh, uh, last week when the Senate uh, approved quite, with quite a large majority a package of $95 billion, uh, including that support for Ukraine, there was hope that the House would take it up immediately. But those hopes have been dashed. Uh, the uh, Speaker of the House, uh, Mike Johnson, seems to be in no hurry. There's talk of not taking up the package until March, uh, uh, at least for another month. So it's good that in the meantime, the Europeans, the French, the Germans, the Brits, British already with a package of 2.5 uh, uh, billion uh, pounds are able to fill that gap. Uh, there's been some good news for Zelensky in Munich in terms of more French cruise missiles, uh, a package of 8 billion now from Germany. Uh, that will help to fill the gap. But of course, the big problem is not just committing the money, it's actually converting that into tanks and artillery shells that arrive on the battlefield. And they're uh, clearly uh, ramping up European defence production. It's not going to happen overnight. The International Court of Justice has rejected South Africa's request for an emergency measure to safeguard civilians in Rafa. The UN's top court noted the perilous situation in the Gaza Strip. It said no new measure was needed because of its judgments last month, which ordered Israel to take all steps to avoid potential genocide, which applied to the whole enclave. Israel has until Friday next week to report back to the ICJ over its ruling. Our correspondent, Noor Harazin, is in Rafa with the latest on the fighting. Well, uh, let us start with uh, where I am now in uh, Rafah, which is now housing more than 1.5 million uh, people. Uh, according to the Palestinian um, health ministry, uh, 10 people were killed in Israeli air raids on Rafah overnight. Most of them are from Judah and Zorob uh, family in Israeli uh, strikes on uh, western uh, Rafah. Uh, and we talked actually about uh, how Palestinian families, displaced Palestinian families, started uh, moving out uh, from Rafah, evacuating Rafah, especially those who have homes in middle Gaza and places like uh, the al Nusayrat refugee camp and the uh, Deir al balah However, uh, today and uh, over the past hours, Israel actually intensified its attacks on uh, middle uh, Gaza, uh, leaving nowhere safe for Palestinians. Palestinians to go. Over the past uh, few hours, we are reporting the uh, continuous Israeli uh, strikes on several residential homes in Deir al balah and al Nusayrat refugee camps. And we are talking about homes that are not only filled with the residents, but also with displaced people who came uh, to those places to take uh, refugee. According to the Palestinian medical sources, we are talking about more uh, than 20 people that were killed and dozens of people that were injured in this Israel, latest Israeli attacks on uh, middle Gaza. Let us also talk about what is happening in the Al Nasser Hospital, which is located in the heart of Khan Yunis. Now, the Israeli land invasion has reached the heart of Khan Yunis city. The uh, Israeli tanks uh, have stormed into the Al Nasser Hospital. They uh, took, the Israeli forces took the uh, people uh, from uh, the different units inside the hospital and uh, besieged them inside uh, one a building and uh, according to doctors and eyewitnesses from the hospital the Israeli forces investigated some of the medical staff and also some of the journalists and the patients adding the fact that they have arrested many of them what is happening inside the Amasur hospital we witnessed the same thing happening inside the Ashifa hospital months ago and also other hospitals like the Indonesian hospital and the Kamal Adwan hospital of course the Israeli side um, in many occasions uh, claimed that uh, there is Hamas infrastructure and Hamas tunnels under the uh, hospitals of Gaza. That was Noor Harazin in Rafa. Elena Bekatoris from the Associated Press is in Jerusalem and I asked her whether Israel really is determined to mount a ground offensive in Rafa. 
the defense minister was saying yesterday that the military is thoroughly planning its uh, its ground incursion into Rafa. Uh, this comes despite, as you say, the growing international uh, concern over how this will happen. Now, what he didn't give was a timeline as to when this would happen. And the Israeli prime minister has said that there will be uh, a, a plan to evacuate the civilians. Roughly 1.4 million people are now sheltering there. But again, for that, there is no clear timeline. And there is also no clear indication as to where these people will go. Uh, what the defense minister did say, however, to allay some of the concerns raised by Egypt, on whose border Rafa lies, is that uh, Israel has no intention of pushing people, of pushing the civilians into Egypt itself. But where they will go, how long it will take to evacuate these people, and when this ground invasion might actually begin is still very unclear. And we've seen increasing cross-border attacks between Israel and Hezbollah in the north, in Lebanon. Uh, where's the, what is the latest there? Well, there has been an escalation recently. Uh, this this cross-border fire began essentially when, when the war in Gaza began as well. Uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon is allied with Hamas, and it has said that it will continue firing rockets into northern Israel until there is a ceasefire in Gaza. Now, in recent days, there was uh, a rocket attack into northern Israel that killed an Israeli soldier. Uh, Israel retaliated with a drone strike that killed three Hezbollah members. The next day, however, there was another strike that killed ten, ten Lebanese civilians. Now, Hezbollah responded to that by saying that uh, it will escalate further if Israel continues an escalation. And it, uh, it stressed that Hezbollah has uh, a large number, a large arsenal of precision-guided weapons. So, of course, this has raised concern even more that this uh, conflict in Gaza could spill further into this region that is already very volatile. Elena Bekatoris reporting from Jerusalem. While demonstrations against the conflict in Gaza continue around the world, thousands of protesters have once again taken to the streets here in London. Our correspondent Rahul Pathak reports. Well, just over four months since the October 7th attacks by Hamas on Israel and the ensuing war on Gaza, protesters say opposition to Israel's offensive in the region remains as strong as ever. Well, this National March for Palestine has been organised by the Stop the War Coalition. Organisers saying up to a quarter of a million people have taken part, all calling for an immediate end to hostilities between Hamas and Israel in Gaza. I think it's getting stronger. Um, I think that the marches depend on uh, how the government responds to a lot of stuff. Um, but I think ultimately the public opinion has changed quite a lot in the last four months. When the government asks... E.G., Israel, move on, we're going to bomb your house. People move on, and then they bomb the people they have moved. Am I lying? You know that's what's happened. This is genocide. And now I'm going to protest the day I die. Now, there is a very large police presence here. Up to 1,500 police officers have been drafted in from forces right around the UK to help keep public order in London this weekend, including at this event. Well, meanwhile, with the war in Gaza set to enter a new phase, with the Israeli military set to begin a ground offensive in the southern settlement of Rafah, US President Joe Biden says he has urged Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that he must have a credible plan to protect civilians sheltering there. The Stop the War Coalition said these protests will continue until an immediate ceasefire is called. Rahul Pathak, CGTN, London. And you're watching CGTN still ahead. Spring success for China's box office as the movie industry celebrates record holiday takings. We'll have the details. Ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans? Grey rhinos? And unicorn companies? Make sense of it all with Global Business, only on CGTF. I think it should be more global cooperation. 
I would like to hear more the voice of the developing countries. Globalization has lifted more than a billion people out of poverty. The great transition has to happen. It's, it's, it's a necessity. But China and, and the United States are, are important powers in the world. What unites us is much more than what uh, divides us. And I believe China is committed to this agenda. Join me, Juliet Mann, to set the agenda at these times every weekend on CPTN. Events have consequences. Words create impact. One more offensive in a long line of battles that's been ongoing for more... You've just got to be careful here with some gunshots. Excuse us, excuse us. The world today matters for your world tomorrow. The number of casualties is growing quickly. Why? This is one of the hardest hit towns in the region. The world today, every day on CGTN. Hello, welcome back. A reminder of our headlines. The humanitarian crisis deepens in southern Gaza as fears grow over an Israeli ground assault on the border town of Rafa. Ukrainian President Zelensky calls for more weapons as his troops withdraw from the eastern city of Avdiivka, marking Russia's biggest gain in months. And China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi is in Germany for the Munich Security Conference, where conflicts in the Middle East and Ukraine dominate the agenda. Earlier this week, Finland elected Alexander Stubb as its new president, and Chinese President Xi Jinping sent his congratulations. In his message, she said that he is ready to work with Stubb to continue nurturing the friendship of the two sides. Our correspondent, Li Jianhua, spoke to Tuti Tuparainen, who's Finland's Minister for European Affairs, at the Security Conference in Munich, and he asked her how Finland sees its relations with China. I believe we have a lot of uh, in common, especially when it comes to economy. Uh, China is a huge economic power, rising but already existing. And it would be a very, you know, against our interest in order to, to enhance protectionism in the world market. We need to engage with China on eye level and we need standards in, in global market and we need rules in the global markets and here the European Union can play a crucial role and Finland as member in the European Union can also advocate uh, market-based rules, uh, competitiveness and, and excellence uh, principle which makes our, our companies and our businesses flourish. I don't believe that it, that would benefit anyone if protectionism grows in the global market. We don't need a trade war, especially for a small open economy like Finland, which is totally dependent on, on uh, global trade and exports. Uh, it would be very, very destructive. Peace, development and security concerns are top of the agenda as African Union leaders gather in the Ethiopian capital Addis Ababa for their annual summit. On Saturday, leaders are discussing the long-held prospect of developing the AU's own financial institutions, including a central bank and a monetary fund. The United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, Filippo Grandi, has warned that Europe may soon have to deal with an influx of Sudanese refugees if a ceasefire is not agreed between the country's warring factions. The number of people fleeing the conflict is already increasing pressure on Sudan's neighbours, as our correspondent, Naba Mohideen, reports. 27-year-old Sohaila Hassan has three school-age children. She had to flee her home in Khartoum nine months ago because of the violence. Now she's hoping to move again, and this time she's looking to Europe. Our children have left school and overnight we became displaced people. I want to immediately leave Sudan to Egypt and then to Europe seeking a better future for our children. The latest conflict in Sudan broke out nearly a year ago. The Sudanese armed forces are battling the paramilitary rabbit support forces and the violence has had a devastating impact on the economy, sparking a massive humanitarian crisis. Hundreds of thousands of Sudanese have fled to neighboring countries and beyond. The number that have reached Europe via North Africa appears to be growing. On February 8, 
the Tunisian government said at least 13 Sudanese asylum seekers died after the boat they were traveling in capsized in the Mediterranean Sea. About 9 million people are thought to be internally displaced in Sudan and 1.5 million have fled into neighboring countries in 10 months of fighting. That means Sudan has the world's most wide scale displacement crisis. Mediation efforts toward a ceasefire have so far failed. Earlier this month, the UN appealed for $4.1 billion to meet the humanitarian needs of civilians. It says the crisis in Sudan demands the world's immediate action. Most of the internally displaced people have relocated to the neighboring countries of Egypt, Central African Republic, Chad, Ethiopia, and South Sudan. My family are in Europe and the U.S. If the situation remains like this, I would leave to Europe by any means and then to the States. We can't wait until the war ends. Here in the city of Port Sudan, where many refugees have arrived, everywhere you turn, there are people wanting to leave. Naba Mohiddin, CGTN, Port Sudan. The former U.S. President Donald Trump has vowed to appeal the almost $355 million penalty he's been ordered to pay by a judge in his civil fraud trial. Trump, who is running for the Republican presidential nomination, is also banned from running companies in New York State for three years. He was found liable for fraudulently overstating his net worth in order to secure favorable bank loans. Japan has successfully launched its next-generation H-3 rocket into space, putting its satellite program back on track after multiple setbacks last year. The rocket blasted off from a launch pad in southwestern Japan on Saturday, marking a second straight space win for the country after its moon lander, called SLIM, touched down on the lunar surface last month. Down here, on Earth, the planet is on track to record the hottest February ever as global warming accelerates. In the first half of this month, 140 countries broke the world record for monthly heat records. Sea surface temperatures also kept climbing unexpectedly. Meteorologists say that intensified human activities and the natural El Nino climate pattern are responsible for the heat. China is celebrating a box office boom as its film market took a record $1.1 billion during the week-long spring festival holiday. Topping the list is YOLO, a remake of the Japanese film 100 Yen Love. It took nearly $400 million in just eight days. Audience numbers also broke records with more than 160 million people taking a seat in movie theatres this past week. Our top stories again. China's Foreign Minister Wang Yi is in Germany for the Munich Security Conference, where conflicts in the Middle East and Ukraine dominate the agenda. President Zelensky of Ukraine calls for more weapons as his troops withdraw from the eastern city of Avdiivka, marking Russia's biggest gain in months. And the humanitarian crisis deepens in southern Gaza as fears grow over an Israeli ground assault on the border town of Rafa. That is the world today. Thank you for watching. There's more news at the top of the hour. Coming up next, it's the agenda with Juliet's man. For now, though, from all the team here in London, it's goodbye. <laughs>